Okay, good morning. Let's go ahead and get started. Just make sure everybody can hear me. Yeah, that looks like it's uh... okay. So today we're going to go ahead and uh, continue into chemistry, and we're going to start up uh, right about where we dropped off, talking about protons, neutrons, and electrons. Any questions on anything so far? Okay. And so in that case, I'm going to go ahead and um, go in here and open up. Um, here we go. Shrink that and open this up. There we go. Okay. So we're talking about chemistry. And, you know, chemistry, you know, again, we're not trying to teach you general chemistry. We're not teaching you chemistry for biology students. We're teaching you enough basic chemistry to understand how the body works. And it isn't so much that uh, you know, no one's ever going to come up to you and say, so in that chemical reaction, what do you think happened to the, to the products or the reactants? It's not like that. It, it just, our bodies are chemical in nature. We have to understand how reactions occur in our bodies. Things happen. Why do things happen? You know, one of the things we encounter uh, on a simple basis, I go back to this again and again, is that, you know, we breathe faster after exercise to get rid of carbon dioxide. Because when we exercise, we burn up sugar and that gives off carbon dioxide. And that carbon dioxide makes our blood more acidic and our brain responds by making us breathe faster. But you know, the brain can get fooled. There is a condition called ketoacidosis that occurs where your, your diabetic patient is unable to process uh, sugars. Let me get these two people in here. And... Okay, so your body is unable, uh, in your diabetic patient's body's unable to process sugars. Sugars can't get into the cell because the insulin's either not there or not working because insulin allows sugar to get through the cell membrane. In ketoacidosis, your body, instead of uh, getting sugar, will start absorbing sugar, assumes you don't have any sugar and it will start breaking down fats. And when you break down fats, you, fats are, are made up of fatty acids. Well, those, when those fatty acids get released, your, it lowers your blood pH, low, it increases your acidity. And your brain thinks, oh, you've been exercising. You've been running around and burning up carbohydrates and releasing carbon dioxide. So here's how we're gonna fix that problem. Your ketoacidotic patient will be breathing rapidly. It'll be almost hyperventilating. Why? Because the brain thinks that it's carbon dioxide causing it. It's a chemical change. It's a chemical reaction going on in the body. And we'll talk all about that in AP too. So, you know, one of the things that the, the downside of our brains using just the acid level in our blood as a determinant when we breathe faster is sometimes it gets it wrong. It breathes fat. We, we breathe faster with ketoacidosis simply because we're breaking down fats. And those fats become release fatty acids into our blood. And our blood gets more acidic, and our brain says, Oh, well, we must have too much carbon dioxide. Let's breathe faster. And it doesn't do a bit of good in ketoacidosis. So we have to understand the chemistry behind things like that. That's, that's why we focus on chemistry in here. So anyway, just a little digression there. So atoms, every atom is the same, at least in its makeup. Every atom has protons and neutrons and electrons. Hydrogen doesn't have neutrons in its, in its um, basic state. Hydrogens doesn't, hydrogens, 
doesn't. Hydrogen doesn't have neutrons, but every other atom does. So every atom is made up of protons, neutrons, and electrons in a specific combination. You know, it's like, um, you know, if you're, it, it is the same, you know, it's the same ingredients in here in the atom, but it, the makeup is different. So uh, if you're like, if, you're, if you were to bake a cake, depending on the type of cake you would want, you would use the same ingredients, but you might, you would change the proportions. Maybe you would add more eggs uh, than, than another, maybe a pound cake uses more eggs. Maybe a pound, I know nothing about baking. But, you know, maybe it uses more butter than a regular cake does, I don't know. But the ingredients are always going to be pretty much the same ingredients. The same applies to these atoms. They're always made up of protons, neutrons, and electrons, but they're in different combinations. Now, every proton that you encounter is going to have a positive charge, always. Protons always have a positive charge, and they're balanced by electrons. Electrons always have a negative charge. And despite the fact that protons have a, uh, an atomic mass unit of one and electrons have an atomic mass unit of zero, it's the charge that matters. So the tiny little electron balances out the big proton because it's, the charge is important. Now, neutrons in the middle have no uh, charge. They're neutral. They have a mass unit of the one, but they have no charge. They don't, they don't go either way. You know, they're not positive, they're not negative, but they do affect the mass of the overall atom. So protons, neutrons, and electrons. Now, as I said, it's the mixture or the combination of these subatomic particles. That's what uh, protons, neutrons, and electrons are subatomic particles, work that into conversation, you know, with your friends and family and, oh, wow, subatomic particles, you know, um, the, um, if I were to, to say subatomic particles in the middle of dinner, my wife would look at me like I had lobsters crawling out of my ears, I don't know. Uh, anyway, the elements, the various elements that are found on the periodic table, the difference in those elements, is solely based on the presence or absence or the combination of these subatomic particles. For example, hydrogen has one proton and one electron, no neutrons. One, one proton, one electron. Any atom that has one proton and one electron all by itself there is hydrogen. Helium has two protons and two electrons. Every proton you have in an atom is balanced by an electron. So every proton is balanced by an electron. The uh, helium also has two neutrons. One of the things about helium is with two protons and two electrons, it is perfectly balanced and can't react with anything else. Helium is one of the, one of the rare non-reactive elements on the periodic table. Helium doesn't combine with any other, with any other um, atom because it's non-reactive. And the next, the element directly below it on the periodic table, uh, freon, is also non-reactive. And underneath that, we have krypton and argon and radon, and all those are non-reactive. We call them the noble gases. They're all unreactive. So, now, third element, lithium. Lithium has three protons, three electrons. And just to throw a little bit of a curve here, it has four neutrons. So there's no sequence to the number of neutrons present. There is a sequence, you know, one, two, three, four, and so on for the protons and electrons, but there is no sequence for the neutrons, you know, because lithium has four. 
and all the neutrons do in lithium is contribute to the, the weight, to the overall weight of the um, of the atom, the overall mass. Now, a couple of things, here, a couple of terms here: atomic number, atomic number, mass number, isotopes, and atomic weight. Atomic number is always the number of protons that are in the nucleus. On the periodic table that we would have in a classroom, there's usually a number in red above the symbol. The symbol for, uh, you know, the atomic symbol is that letter, like C for carbon, O for oxygen, H for hydrogen, things like that. So we have, for carbon, for example, you would have the C for carbon, and above it, you have a red number. It doesn't have to be red, it's just on our periodic table that we have on campus, we have the great big red six in this case. Six protons, that tells you how many protons are in the nucleus. We have the symbol on top. That also equals the number of electrons. So if you look at the periodic table and you see an atom and you see the number on top of the atom, that's the atomic number. That's how many protons it has. It's also how many electrons it has. Underneath the symbol, you have another number, which is usually twice the atomic number. It's the mass number or the, the weight. You know, we sort of tend to use those interchangeably, at least as far as we're concerned. The atomic weight of uh, a carbon atom is 12 because it has six protons and six neutrons. Oxygen has uh, an atomic number of eight, eight protons and eight electrons, and its weight is 16, because it has eight neutrons in there too. Hydrogen has an atomic number of one. It has one proton, no neutrons. Helium has an atomic number of four, two protons, two neutrons. Lithium has atomic number of seven, three protons, four neutrons. So the number underneath the symbol is the sum of all the protons and all the neutrons. Remember, electrons don't have any, any mass, so we can't count them. We only, the charge is more important than the weight anyway. So protons and neutrons added together give you the atomic weight. We use weight and mass. You know, we, we tend to get interchangeable in that because uh, we don't we don't have to make that kind of distinction. If you take the chemistry class, you probably make the distinction. But for our purposes, the, the weight is the, is the sum of the protons and the neutrons. Now our atoms are organized so that the electrons orbit the nucleus. The nucleus contains the protons. The, the, um, Nucleus contains the neutrons. Now it's sort of the, it is similar in appearance to the nucleus of a cell, only in the sense that the nucleus is in the center of the atom. That's, you know, because the nucleus of a cell is in the center of the cell, more or less. The nucleus of the atom is in the center of the atom. That's the only comparison between nucleus of a cell and a nucleus of an atom. The nucleus of the atom is in the center. It's contained, made up of protons and neutrons. All the electrons are in orbit around the nucleus. They orbit the nucleus like the Earth orbits the sun, or the moon orbits the Earth, or the moons of Mars orbit Mars, and Mars orbits the sun. You know, same, same thing. The electrons are going to orbit they're gonna be attracted to the nucleus. They're not gonna be drawn into the nucleus. They're going to be out in the space around the nucleus. So they spin at 186,000 miles an hour, speed of, I mean, miles per second, speed of light. We can't, you know, we can't really comprehend 186,000 miles per hour or miles per second. You know, it's fast, faster than we can see. And there's two ways of, of looking at this. Now, there's a, the classic approach 
is what's known as the planetary model. And a planetary model looks just like a, a chart of the solar system, you know, in, in a sense. And we've all seen that as you have the, the, the various planets lined up orbiting the sun, you know, and closer in planets, you know, have a smaller orbit. And the planets that are way out there, like 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 Pluto, Pluto is still a planet. Uh, no matter what they say. Pluto is way out there and Mercury's in real close and they're in orbit around the sun. And that's how we look at, that's how the planetary model describes electrons, protons, and neutrons. Well, it's not accurate. We don't care. At least in AMP, we don't care. It's not an accurate model to truly represent what's going on because the electrons are all over the place in their, or they orbit. And they stay at a, a pretty set distance from the nucleus, but they are orbiting so fast we can't say where they are. So a true model, the orbital model, shows just a fuzzball around the nucleus because they're moving so fast. You, you know, if you try to get a picture of them, even with the highest speed uh, camera that you could arrange, uh, and we have some pretty amazing, there are some pretty amazingly fast cameras available. All you'd see is, is, a, is a, uh, a cloud. It's accurate. But for our purposes, that the planetary model still shows us where the electrons are going to be. Here we see um, this, this top picture here is the planetary model. There's helium. It has two protons in its nucleus and two electrons in orbit around the nucleus. And distance is pretty well fixed in there. Um, just like the, the Earth is 93 million miles, you know, give or take a, a million miles or so, because it probably has a little wobble. But you know, we, we know that the Earth is 93 million miles away from the sun. We don't get closer. We don't go far, farther out. We stay around an average of 93 million miles. The moon revolves around the Earth around 240,000 miles, plus or minus a couple thousand miles, depending on you know, uh, any, uh, any wobble. But it stays there. It stays constant. You know, we don't see the moon getting really close. You know, uh, every so often there's an internet sensation where we see a super moon tonight. The, the moon will never be closer than it is tonight. It'll be take up half the horizon and you need to know it doesn't it isn't that big at all. It, you know, we can't uh, we can't look at the moon and say, oh, it's it's significantly closer than it is tonight because it's you know it's the orbit has dipped. Um, if if it got really close, we'd have some real problems here on Earth. Anyway, planetary model, it works for us because it does show you where the electrons are. The, orb the orbital model gives you a cloud, a cloud of electrons. And um, that's the reality of it. The, um, the electrons are moving so rapidly, you can't say exactly where they are in that orbit. They're there, but you can't say exactly where they are. Because at 186,000 miles per second, you can't get a true accurate picture, the best we can do is this, this, this cloud around it. So anyway, but if you're going to draw, if someone challenges you to draw a picture of an atom with the electrons, you know, you're going to draw it like the planetary model. And I will tell you that I've never ever encountered anybody that had to be challenged to draw a picture of an elect of electron model around around the nucleus. So Nobody comes up to you in the street and says, hey, quick, draw a diagram of hydrogen. So, but if you wanted to draw a diagram of hydrogen, here it is. This is the planetary model. This works for us. There's hydrogen, one proton, one electron in orbit. There's helium, two protons, two electrons. The um, Third atom here is lithium. Lithium has two protons here and a third, I'm sorry, three protons here and two electrons in this orbit. 
and one electron in the next orbit out. Because it seems that atoms have these rules that they follow, that it will that they can only hold two electrons in their first orbit. Always. No more than two in the first orbit. So there's a third electron for lithium. And so it goes into a brand new orbit a little further out. But what happens now about what do we do about the uh, neutrons? The neutrons have no impact on these electrons and the protons. Neutrons have no impact uh, on this. What neutrons do is they can alter the weight of the atom. And sometimes that becomes variable. We call some uh, an atom affected by, you know, that's, that's heavier, for example, or lighter than what we would expect. Like when we see lithium, lithium has four neutrons and it has three protons. That gives it an atomic weight of seven. What if it had eight neutrons or what if it had six neutrons and the weight of lithium was he significantly heavier? Heavier, heavier, or what if it had two neutrons and it was lighter? That would still be lithium because it still has three protons and three electrons, but it would now be what we call an isotope. Isotopes are atoms, but they are structurally different from one another. They are the same element, but they are structurally different. They have a heavier or a lighter, a greater or a lighter weight. Isotopes have the same number of protons, same number of electrons, but they have different, a different number of neutrons than most of the other atoms of that na nature. So all, most of the lithium atoms, for example, have atomic weight of seven because that's four neutrons, three protons. What if it had five neutrons. It had an atomic weight of eight, thanks to the extra neutron. The atomic numbers are always going to be the same on an isotope. You know, carbon, for example. Carbon always has an atomic number of six. The protons don't change. The electrons don't change. But its weight can change. The most common form of carbon has an atomic weight of 12. But there is a variation called carbon-14. And in between that, there's a carbon-13, too. These isotopes are usually unstable, and they break down. They're not the stable version of the atom. And they're essentially radioactive. Most of, them are, most of the isotopes are going to be radioactive. We call them radioisotopes, clever name there, um, because they will decompose to the stable form. They, atoms want to become stable. So a, a carbon atom that has carbon-14 in it is going to decompose. It's going to release electrons. I'm not sorry. It's going to release energy. It's trying to release radioactive energy, alpha particles, beta particles, Gamma rays, gamma rays are the same things in X-rays, or essentially the same as X-rays. They're going to release energy so they can kick out those excess neutrons. The neutrons are held in place by um, the energy of the universe, if you will. And the atom will gradually release that energy at a constant rate to get rid of the excess neutrons. If you release enough energy, it'll kick out a neutron. Release more energy, it'll kick out another neutron. Eventually, all the extra neutrons get kicked out. And if you were carbon-14, you would, you would eventually become carbon-12, the stable version of carbon. They have what's known as radioactive decay. Radioactivity is the release of this energy from the nucleus of the atom, trying to get rid of the extra neutrons. And here an example, hydrogen. Here are two isotopes of hydrogen. You can have plain, ordinary, garden variety hydrogen on the left, 
one proton, one electron. A chemist would call it protein, but we're just going to call it hydrogen. The one in the middle has one neutron in the nucleus along with the protons. And we call this deuterium. It has an atomic weight of two. It's heavier than regular hydrogen. If you could use <clears throat> deuterium to make, to combine with oxygen to make water, you create something called heavy water. Heavy water is used in nuclear power plants to absorb neutrons. Because yeah, you always have these stray neutrons running loose. You know, always, the concern is always, do we want to have any radioactivity leaking out? Do we want to have neutrons leaking out? And so this heavy water, this hydrogen made with deuterium can absorb excess neutrons. So they, a lot of times the core of the reactor is surrounded by this heavy water made with deuterium. Tritium is even heavier. Tritium has two neutrons in the nucleus along with the proton. It has an atomic weight of three. Still one proton, one electron, but it's an even different, even has a greater difference than deuterium does. Still hydrogen, but two different versions of hydrogen. So we know that the isotopes are unstable. They want to degrade down to their every, you know, to the to the uh, common version, to the stable version of the atom. So they'll kick out this energy. So why do we care? That's a good question. We care because we can use radioactive isotopes in healthcare, in testing, and in treatment. The uh, the rate of decay of a rate of certain types of radioactive atoms is well known. Some decay very rapidly. Some kick out their energy at a, well, they all kick out their energy at a constant rate. For some, that rate is very quick, very rapid, and some it's very slow. For example, the half-life is how long it takes an atom to release half of its energy, its radioactive energy. So it has a half-life in, in that time frame of a half-life, it will half the energy will be gone. And in another half-life, another half will be gone, and another half-life, another half-life will be gone. Now, car radioactive carbon, carbon 14, has a half-life of 5,000 years. So it takes a while to get rid of its radioactivity. Iodine, some isotopes of iodine have half-lives measured in hours or days, usually a couple days, maybe, maybe just hours. We can use these isotopes for testing purposes or for treatment. Consider this, iodine is an element that is essential for our bodies to make thyroid hormone. Thyroid hormone made in the thyroid gland located in the middle, in the front of your neck, uh, clever name, you know, thyroid gland, makes thyroid hormone. Thyroid hormone controls all of our metabolic activities in our bodies. How rapidly do we burn up carbohydrates, burn up sugars? How rapidly do we burn up fat? It allows us to release energy we need when we need it. The thyroid hormone controls all the chemical reactions that take place in our body. If our thyroid hormone levels are elevated, we become hyperactive. We burn up food at a faster rate. We have rapid weight loss, but we also become significantly agitated and um, irritable and um, excitable and have an elevated heart rate. So it's not a good thing. Too little thyroid hormone lowers our metabolic rate. We get cold easy, worse, where we don't think quickly. We, um, um, we start, we swell up, we get constipated. We, you know, we're, we're, we're just sort of, uh, we sort of, we're very sluggish in our, in our actions and our thinking. Uh, so thyroid hormone is essential to maintain 
homeostasis, I haven't said that for a day or two, homeostasis of metabolic activities in the body. And you can't make thyroid hormone without iodine. Iodine is absolutely essential to make thyroid hormone. We get our, we get our iodine out of our salt, out of table salt. So anyway, if the thyroid, and the only place iodine goes to in the body that's rapidly taking it up is the thyroid gland in the middle of the neck. And right above the little, you know, right above that little notch that you find in your neck. If you administer radioactive iodine to a patient, the only place that iodine is going to collect is in the thyroid gland in the patient's neck. Now, you can examine then an x-ray. This is a great little non-invasive technique. You can examine an x-ray of, uh, or a scan of the thyroid and see where the, where the radioactive iodine went. This illustration here, this photograph here, shows a dark spot. All this area that's glowing, yes, their thyroid's slowing in the dark. Everything that's, that's lit up here is where the radioactive iodine has been taken into the thyroid gland. No, it doesn't go anywhere else. It only goes into the thyroid. Because the thyroid is the only place that's going to accept the iodine. It doesn't matter if it's radioactive or not. It's iodine, so the thyroid gland takes it. Here we have a dark spot. Something is growing there that's not using the iodine. And so without having to do any kind of exploratory procedure, we can look at this and say, well, there is something on the left-hand side of that image that is dark and it's not taking up iodine. Now we have a target area. If you wanted to treat something, if that were a cancer, for example, instead of using this iodine that is very low level, um, you know, has a very quick, very short half-life and it doesn't release a lot of um, energy, you could administer a more powerful isotope of iodine, which would release enough alpha, beta, and gamma part gamma rays to kill the uh, cancer in here. So there's there's a variety of um, approaches that we can use I isotopes for. You know, classic I uh, test using a radioactive isotope is the thyroid scan. We also use them for evaluating gallbladder activity. Uh, radiation can be used to destroy cancer cells in a variety of ways. Sometimes we can use direct application of isotopes. Other times we use like a, like a beam, like a proton beam here advertised. You know, it, it's still radiation to destroy the cancer. Anyway, that is the variation. Isotopes are the um, a variation on the the norm, if you will. If the normal, if a if a stable atom like carbon has six protons and six neutrons, that's its stable version. If it has six protons and eight neutrons, it's unstable. And atoms don't like instability. And the benefit we get to see is that th this release of energy can be used for testing, and for, for evaluation, and for treatment. So, okay, now let's take a look. So we know about atoms. We know that, you know, so if you we looked at isotopes, we looked at isotopes with an excess number of neutrons that they will eventually get rid of. We know that protons, neutrons, and electrons are in the atoms with protons and neutrons in the nucleus and electrons in orbit around the nucleus. So how does this apply to chemistry? Well, when we look at molecules, we look at molecules. What's a molecule? A molecule is simply two or more atoms together. They're bonded together. They are held together by what we call a chemical bond. Now, a compound, the definition here is a compound is um, a molecule with two or more different types of atoms together. So a molecule, 
O2, you know, same atom that you see. Oxygen and oxygen, atmospheric oxygen, the oxygen that we breathe in the air is called O2. Because it has two oxygen atoms bound together. That's a molecule. We don't breathe elemental oxygen. We don't breathe the oxygen that's on the periodic table. We breathe an at we breathe a molecule of it where two of those atoms are combined. That's a molecule. Now a compound is when you have a mixture of different types of atoms bonded together, like water, H2O, hydrogen and oxygen. That's considered a compound. We still say a molecule of water. You know, the, the, picture, the illustration there on the slide is um, glucose, C6, meaning there's six carbon atoms, 12 H12, 12 hydrogen atoms, and six oxygen atoms. That's glucose. That's a, we refer to it as a molecule. We call, essentially, even though it's a compound, we, we pretty much call everything molecules. So molecules are specific. Molecules are a chemi they, they are made up of a chemical bond. Oxygen and hydrogen together to form water is a chemical bond. The, the properties of water are different from the individual properties of the hydrogen and the oxygen. The properties of glucose, C6H12O6, properties of glucose, the simple sugar, are different than the properties of the carbon atoms, the hydrogen atoms, and the oxygen atoms. When they come together, they've changed. You can't take um, water and run it through a filter and separate out the hydrogen and the oxygen. You can't run glucose, sugar, through a filter and separate out the carbons. Carbons go over here, hydrogen's in the middle, oxygen's on the other side. We can't do that because they're, 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 they're glued together. They are bound together. And this makes chemical combinations different than most other types of matter that we've seen. This is matter. Water is matter. Glucose, sugar is matter. But the chemical bonding is different than most of the matter that we encounter. Most matter is simply a mixture. Physical intermixing of the ingredients. You know, something that you could filter out. You could, you could, since they're physically intermixed, they can be physically separated because there's no chemical bond going on here. Consider a solution. A solution is a usually based on water, where you have a substance dissolved in another medium. You know, it can be sugar dissolved in water, salt dissolved in water, or it can be oxygen dissolved in atmospheric air or nitrogen dissolved in atmospheric air. So a solution is, oh, you have solutions, colloids, and suspensions. You'll see, you, you, know, you want to know what a colloid is, think of a glass of milk. And a suspension, think of um, blood. Okay, let me talk about uh, solutions here. A solution is a homogeneous mixture. You may have heard me talk about this a little bit in lab. If not, you'll hear me talk about it today. Uh, a homogeneous mixture means it, there, it, it all looks the same. If you have a glass, uh, uh, if you have a beaker of distilled water and a beaker of distilled water with 100 grams of salt dissolved into it, you say it's in solution. They're both identical. They're transparent. There, there are no particles in either beaker. You can't look at them and say, this is the salt water, this is the distilled water. Can't tell the difference. The particles in the salt water are evenly distributed. The oxygen, the water molecules in solution are evenly distributed. It all looks the same. 
solvents are the dissolve or what we call a dissolving medium. A solvent will dissolve things. Water is considered the universal solvent. We pay attention to this because our bodies are 70% water. And you know, all of our chemical reactions in our bodies take place in water. So we have the solvent. The solute is what gets dissolved in the solvent. Sugar in blood, you know, not, the, not in the cells, but in the plasma. Blood is made up of red cells and white cells and platelets floating in the salt water plasma, somewhere between, you know, for, somewhere between 45 and 55% of our blood is this salt water plasma. Within that plasma, we have blood sugar, we have glucose. Glucose is dissolved in the plasma. We can't see it. If you take out a sample of blood and, and spin it down or let it set out, the plasma will, will uh, separate from the red, the red from the blood cells. The blood cells will sink to the bottom of the test tube, the plasma will be on top, and the plasma, while it will look uh, pale yellow, it is still transparent. It contains the dissolved glucose, the dissolved salts and dissolved proteins in there. You can't see them, they're there, they're in solution. So a solute, when we say a solute is dissolved, it means it has gone in, it has been taken up in the solution. The particles have been spread evenly throughout the solution and it becomes transparent. Doesn't matter it's light yellow, doesn't matter like even Coke is a bottle of Coke is a solution. It's transparent, even though it has the caramel color uh, in, in it, you can still see through it. You can see through coffee, even though it's dark, you can see through it, it's, it's a solution. You can't look at iced tea, iced tea is a, is a solution. You look at the tea, you can't tell if it's sweet tea or unsweet tea or a mixture. It's transparent. So all solutions are transparent, whether it is an, uh, a liquid or a gas. You know, the air we're breathing is a solution. It's a mixture of nitrogen and oxygen and a little methane and a little carbon dioxide all thrown together. It's invisible. You can't look at the air around us and say, oh, there's the oxygen. Oh, there's the methane. Stay away from that doesn't work that way. It's all dissolved in the overall atmospheric air. The same is true uh, for the things we drink. If you have, um, when you add sugar to a uh, beaker of water, it goes into solution. It's invisible. The same with salt. You can't look at two, in, two beakers, one that's 10% sugar and one that's 10% salt, and tell which one is which. We can't tell which one, if you had a, a beaker of distilled water next to it, they'd all look the same. They'd all be clear, transparent. There'd be nothing to give away what's inside the solution. So the solute is, is what's getting dissolved. The solvent is a dissolving medium. It's usually water in our bodies. The solutes are things like sugar or sodium or potassium or you know, calcium. So you know, there, are a, there are a variety of salts that are in solution. There are a variety of there's sugar in solution, there are proteins. The thing is that with a solution, however, because it's not a chemical change, if you had a beaker, it's it, because it's not a chemical change, you can separate out the solutes. You can run the, uh, if you have a 10% salt solution, you can run it through a filter and filter out all the salt. If you have a 10% sugar solution, you can run it through a filter and filter out all the sugar, or you can take your beaker of salt water and set it aside and let the water evaporate. 
and what'll be left behind is the salt. The salt doesn't disappear when the water evaporates. The same with the sugar, it's left behind in the beaker because it's not a chemical change. There's no, nothing, the water doesn't change, the salt doesn't change, it's in solution, or the sugar doesn't change, it's in solution. It's not a chemical change, it's simply a physical change. Mixtures are a physical change. You take sand and water, you know, you're at the beach and you, you know, for whatever reason, you get a bucket of uh, you know, salt water. You know, who hasn't done this at one point in their lives? You know, when you're at the beach and, and, and you're a kid and you're building something in the sand and you get a bucket of water and it's got water and sand in there and you could filter out all the sand. Or if you're later on in life, if you're built making concrete, you're, you're fixing a sidewalk, you're building a sidewalk. You, you mix all the ingredients together. They're physically intermixed, but you know, the sand and the gravel are still in there. So anyway, solutions are one of the things in healthcare, healthcare, in healthcare that we deal with all the time. When you have an IV line going into a patient, that's a no, first of all, it's a known volume. Second of all, the um, ingredients are going to be on the bag. It's going to tell you what it is. If, you if you're administering what we call normal saline to a patient, the concentration of sodium in the bag is exactly the same percentage as it is in our, in our blood. It's a solution. We use it all the time. We, we have a known percentage of, of sodium chloride uh, going into our, our blood. And your knowledge of solutions, your knowledge of solutions and how solutions are made will tell you, you know, is that the right amount that's not supposed to be on the chart that the patient's getting? Most common way that we measure solutions is by percentage. Very simple process. If you want to make a 10% salt solution in a liter of water, you would take one liter of water in a beaker and add 100 grams of sodium chloride to it. 100 is 10%, is 100 is one tenth of a thousand. There are a thousand milliliters in a liter. So one, one tenth of a thousand is a hundred. So you would add a hundred grams of sodium chloride to the beaker and you would now have a 10% salt solution. It's a very simple procedure. <clears throat> so simple that we don't, you know, in, in healthcare, unless you're working in the pharmacy, you're not gonna be making up these solutions. In fact, most of the solutions with, with Normal saline are probably what uh, already manufactured. The um, but other medications that are administered through an IV are you know made the same way. There are percentages. In lab, we do demonstrations when we're on the ground. We do demonstrations using ten percent salt, forty percent glucose, you know, one percent starch, things like that that are easy to make up because we're just dealing with you know, a liter of water and whatever percent we want to make the solution. If we want to make a 40% glucose solution, we would use 40, we would use 400 grams of glucose in, in 1000 milliliters of water. That's 40% gives you a very strong glucose solution. We want to make up a 1% sodium chloride solution, we would put in 10 grams of sodium chloride, very, very mild solution here. So nearly everything in healthcare, on, on, particularly in medications is based on, is gonna be based on percentages and we base it on these simple solutions here. You know, what percent solution are you dealing with? There are a few exceptions to this. Um, 
Solutions also can be measured in what we call deciliters, uh, milligrams per deciliter. There's just a few places where we do this. Blood sugar. Blood sugar is measured in milligrams per deciliter. Uh, it's uh, elevated blood sugar uh, may be an indicator of diabetes. May. You know, we've we've all had blood work done. We've all had that had blood tests taken. You know, where you the, the, the fasting blood sugar level, you know, you don't eat anything after midnight and you, you try to get into the lab early in the morning so that you can go eat afterwards. Um, yeah, so you have, uh, we, we measure blood glucose, blood sugar in milligrams per deciliter. A deciliter is one one hundredth of a liter. So if, you're, if you do the math in your head, you can see that's still a lot of sugar in your body. We try to stay under 100. You know, um, it says 80, but anywhere between 80 and 100 is going to be um, uh, you know, a good number. Anywhere, you know, uh, we don't start getting concerned about our blood sugar levels until we start consistently running over 100 uh, milligrams per deciliter. And in most cases, when you're recording that information, you know, you're recording the number, you know, and it's understood that is milligrams per deciliter. Okay, so blood glucose levels, we use milligrams per deciliter. The third way we measure solutions doesn't occur in healthcare. It occurs in chemist land. Chemists use this term all the time, molarity. Now, molarity refers to the number of moles of solute per liter of solvent. Now, what is a mole? Well, we know it's that little thing that, that burrows through the ground and digs up your garden. So that's a mole, but that's not the mole we're talking about. Uh, a mole is a unit of measure. It is, the, it is a compound that is made is equal to the molecular weight of of the of the compound molecular weight of the compound. What am, I, what am I trying to say here? If you have glucose, glucose has six carbons, twelve hydrogens, and six oxygens. Each one of those carbon atoms has an atomic weight. Each one of the hydrogen atoms has an atomic weight, and so do the oxygens. If you add up all the atomic weights in that molecule, you have the molecular weight. And the molecular weight of a glucose molecule is around 180. If you convert that to grams, you now have a mole. A mole is simply the molecular weight in grams of any compound. So if you have uh, glucose, Molecular weight is 180, so 180 grams of uh, glucose is one mole. If you mix up 180 grams of glucose in a liter of water, you have a one molar solution of glucose. Okay. If you, uh, the molecular weight of sodium chloride is 58. If you have put 58 grams of glucose if you put 58, uh, 58 grams of uh, sodium chloride into a liter of water, you have a one molar solution of uh, sodium chloride. Now, we usually don't refer to one molar solutions or two molar solutions when talking about glucose or uh, salt. In the, chemical, in the chemistry laboratory, we refer to the molar uh, concentration when we're talking about the acids, acids and bases. You know, one molar, six molar, uh, uh, point 0.1 molar. You know, we use that in, in chemists use that as a as a measure of uh, uh, concentration strength. So we don't really see much of uh, that in healthcare. However, one of the constants about a mole, which is really phenomenal. Yeah. Uh, it's phenomenal how this was discovered because uh, it's something called Avogadro's number. Avogadro was a uh, early, early chemist uh, hundreds of years ago. He did all this, uh, 
either in his head or uh, on paper. Every mole of any substance has the same number of solute particles in it. And that number is a constant. The, no, the number called Avogadro's number is 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. And you know, chemists, being chemists, celebrate uh, Mole Day on uh, October 23rd at 6.02 in the morning. It's what they do, you know. I guess if you're a chemist, you don't get, to, you don't get out much anyway. So Mole Day, uh, is 10.23. So um, the point is that every sub, every solution, every, mo one, every molar solution, every one molar solution will have the same number of solute particles. And well, that's nice. And you, you, you do need to remember Avogadro's number for testing purposes, I'll tell you that. You know, um, The reason it's important to us is it's the presence of the solute particles that determine the movement of water across cell membranes. Solute particles drive the movement of water. If you have low solute levels on one side of a membrane, that means water, that means you have high water levels. If you have high solute concentrations on the, another, on the other side of a membrane, that means your water levels are lower. And for those of you that have already had lab, you've heard me talk about osmosis. Osmosis is a term for moving water across a cell membrane based on high water going to low water. Osmosis, the easy definition is Osmosis is the movement of water from a high water area to a low water area. We'll talk about that in lab today. We'll talk about it again later on in lecture. High water always equals low solute. Low water always equals high solute. Now, so the only reason we care about Avogadro's number is because a one molar solution of anything has the exact same number of particles inside of it. One molar solution of salt, a one molar solution of sodium of uh, glucose, uh, a one molar solution of uh, sucrose, table sugar, gonna have the same number of solute particles. And so the pressure to move something across a membrane, uh, one molar to one molar is identical. Enough of that. So now, so that's solutions. The uh, second type of a mixture, my dogs are going, going, getting a little agitated outside. Who knows what's going on? So anyway, colloids. Colloids are emulsions. Emulsions are heterogeneous, meaning they have unequal distribution of the particles that are in the mixture. Milk is a colloid because you have the milk fat floating in with the uh, watery uh, non-fat portion of the milk there. So, these large particles, the particles of milk fat, stay suspended in the, in, in the mixture. They don't settle down. They don't settle out. They're just suspended there. They float in there. You can't take, you know, if you get a, a bottle of whole milk, you can't see through it. It's, you know, it's not transparent. The milk fat in whole milk is suspended throughout the entire mixture of, of the milk. You could filter the fat out. It's, these mixtures are not, not, these are all physical combinations. There's no chemical change here. You could take whole milk and run it through a, a filter that would be small, that has small enough holes to filter out the milk fat. 
and then the watery portion of the milk could come through. So you would, you know, this, you know, if you wanted to, you could do that. That's how we get skim milk. We filter out the, the fat. But whole milk has the, the you know, but even then the, the, uh, uh, the watery portion of milk is still gonna be uh, 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 opaque, not transparent. So that's a colloid where you have a, essentially a suspension, well, not a suspension, where you have particles suspended in the mixture. No longer transparent. Milk is a classic example of this as a colloid or emulsion. You see this with jello. Even though jello is semi transparent, uh, jello it suspends particles in there. So it's not completely transparent. Uh, jello is like that. Uh, puddings are like that. Fat is like that. Uh, so that's a, um, that's a colloid. Now, if we look at the third category here, and this gives you an example of uh, uh, you know, the, the um, solutions and colloids and suspensions, the particles in a colloid never settle out. In a suspension, they will. The third category, instead of being held in place in, in the mixture, here the particles will physically separate. If you have a um, sample of a blood sample and you set it aside, the red cells, you know, you have whole blood, the red cells and white cells will settle out. And what's left, and you'll separate into plasma and red cells, mostly red cells. That's what you see here. In the upper right hand side of the picture, you see whole blood on the left and uh, blood that has separate has been allowed to settle out on the right. Now, this is actually a, is what happens if you put a whole blood test tube in a centrifuge and spin it down. All the red cells and white cells move to the bottom of the tube and the plasma is uh, 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 floating above that. The solutes in a suspension will settle to the bottom. You can either spin the blood tube down or you can let it sit for four or five hours, you'll get the same result. It will settle out. You know, water and sand settle, will separate. Sand sinks to the bottom of a, you, know, you have an aquarium, you're setting up an aquarium. So you put in, um, you put like four inches of sand at the bottom of the aquarium, you pour the sand in, and then you dump in 30 gallons of water on top of that, and you have one big cloudy uh, mixture in the water. The sand is everywhere. You can't see through it. Hopefully, you didn't have to fish in there yet. So there's sand everywhere, in, you know, in suspension. But gradually, the grains of sand sink to the bottom of the aquarium. And you have a, you know, the water portion is visible. The sand portion is visible. They're, they're not mixed together anymore. Suspensions will settle out. Something as simple as Italian salad dressing. Italian salad dressing is you have all the ingredients in the vinegar portion and you have the oil on top and you shake it up and the oil gets mixed with the vinegar uh, and all the uh, seasonings are you know, scattered throughout. But then if you let it sit long enough, you know, all the, the seasonings in, in, the, uh, in the salad dressing sink to the bottom of the bottle. The oil separates and goes to the top. So suspensions, the, the mixtures will physically separate themselves. And in all of these mixtures, you could physically separate them yourself, whether it's a solution. You could, you could filter out the salt. You could filter out the sugar. You could... Theoretically, take um, uh, a glass of iced tea and run it through uh, a filter that would take out the sugar and take out the tea particles in there and leave behind the water. Or coffee, even though it's a very fine mixture in here, you would have the coffee particles separated from the water because it's not a chemical change 
to the water. Okay. Sweet tea is not a chemical change to the sugar. You know, it's not a chemical change to the coffee particles in the coffee. It's a very fine size particle, but you can filter it. You can filter any of, of that, those, those, the, these mixtures. You can filter out the red cells and the white cells and the plasma from blood. You know, if you've ever given blood, you can see if there are they going to collect plasma? Are they going to collect platelets? Are they going to collect packed red cells? They separate, you know, at, at a blood bank, they're going to be separating out these, these components all the time. So mixtures, while most matter is made of mixtures, mixtures are not chemical are not chemical changes. Chemical changes, chemical molecules have undergone a chemical change. They are different from what you started with. If you're you know, building a sidewalk, you, know, you, you know, your sand and gravel and, uh, and cement and whatever else you put into the sand into make concrete, you know, what you finish with is the, the same ingredients are there. They can be, while the, the concrete is solid, you can break it apart into the individual components. There has been no chemical change. The same with a salt water or sugar solution. But chemical bonding is different. Chemical changes are different. Chemical changes involve energy. It's all about energy here. And it's all based on the electrons. Chemical changes are all based on the presence or absence of the electrons. A chemical change is not a physical change. When you combine carbon and hydrogen and oxygen to make glucose, you still have the carbon atoms, the hydrogen atoms, and the oxygen atoms, but they are now held together but it's not a physical change. It is the movement of electrons in here. And these um, the electrons hold the, the electrons hold the various atoms together. And so the properties are totally different than what you started with. Now to understand how this works, we need to know we need to consider what the electrons are doing. Now, we know the electrons are in orbit around the nucleus. We, we know that. We've been talking about that for two days now, I guess. So the electrons are in orbit around the nucleus. They are in orbits or shells. You know, if I say orbital or I say shell, I mean the same thing. The electrons are in specific orbits around the nucleus. And the orbit is based on how much kinetic energy and how much potential energy the various the, the electrons have. Electrons in their very first orbit, you know, like in um, helium, with its two electrons in orbit around the nucleus. Electrons in there are using a lot of kinetic energy to keep from being sucked into the nucleus. Now, remember that electrons and protons are balanced. The, charge of, uh, the negative charge of an electron is balanced by the positive charge of a proton. But in the nucleus, you have all the protons together. So let's say that you are carbon, for example and you've got six protons. You've got six large protons. The, the, the size is, all, is pro, protons are always the same size, but compared to the electrons, it's, it's large. So you have six large protons in the nucleus of a carbon atom, six positive charges in the first orbit around the nucleus. You have two electrons. And they're not, they don't run together, they run individually in this, they're in the same orbit 
but they are not running side by side. They're apart because they're moving so fast anyway. Each one has a negative charge. It has each individual electron in that first orbit has to fight off the attraction of those six protons. So that electron has to spend most of its kinetic energy. You know, it has kinetic energy because it's moving around at the speed of light. It has to use most of its kinetic energy to resist the attraction of the nucleus. Because the nucleus is large. The nucleus has very, has six powerful protons pulling against each individual electron. So these, these, these electrons in that first shell, that first orbit or orbital, has to have to work very hard to resist the attraction. It's like the moon. The moon is at 240,000 miles away from the Earth. That's you know, pretty much where it is, you know, somewhere around 240. And it fluctuates a little bit. But it doesn't get any closer to the Earth. The Earth attract is, is pulling on the moon. The moon is pulling on the Earth. And while the kinetic energy, the, the, the moon's kinetic energy is keeping it from being drawn into the Earth. The moon spends a lot of its energy staying away from the Earth. The Earth is pulling on the moon. The moon's pulling on the Earth. But the moon is resisting that pull, which is a good thing, because we really don't want the moon to smash into the Earth. Uh, that would be a bad thing. Um, the same as the, 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 pl the planet Earth is resisting the pull of the sun. You know, the sun is massive compared to the size of the Earth. You know, um, thousands and thousands of, of planet Earths could fit inside the sun. So the thing is huge. You know, even though it's 93 million miles away and it looks like this, you know, this is a small object in the sky, it's massive, and the pull on the Earth is trying to pull it in towards the, uh, the sun. Our gravitational pull is pulling us away. So we're sort of stuck here at 93 million miles. You know, we're using a lot of our kinetic energy to stay where we are. Same with the moon around the Earth. It's using a lot of its kinetic energy to stay where it's are. Electrons in the first shell around nucleus spend a great deal of energy to avoid being sucked into the nucleus. And they, they succeed, but that doesn't leave a lot of energy left over to do anything. Their potential energy in that first shell is pretty low. Now we, you know, because we can, we can think of these shells as energy levels too. So if in the first shell, you would see lots of kinetic energy, little potential energy because it's spending so much power to stay out of the nucleus. So an atom can have an, can have an, an atom can have seven electron shells that we know of. You know, seven electron shells. And each shell will fill up as more and more electron if, if, if there are more electrons in the atom, you know, if you have, you have 10 protons, that means you've got 10 electrons. If you've got 15 protons, you have 15 electrons. We will gradually fill up each shell moving away from the nucleus. So if you have 10 protons, you have 10 electrons. Now, the first shell can only hold two electrons. So you put two electrons in the first shell. You still have a if you if you're if you if you have ten protons, you have ten electrons. You put two protons in the first shell. I mean, I'm sorry. You put two electrons in the first shell. You put eight electrons in the second shell. The second shell can only hold eight electrons, but you're fine. You have you put all your electrons where they belong. Ten protons, ten electrons. Ten protons in the nucleus. Two protons, I'm mean, oh, sorry, 10 protons in the nucleus, two electrons in the first shell, eight electrons in the second shell. First shell can only hold two electrons. Second shell can hold eight. The third shell 
can hold either eight or 18. Look something like this. This is aluminum, atomic number 13. 13 protons, 13 electrons. You can see that you have all these protons and neutrons in the uh, uh, nucleus. It has uh, 13 protons and 14 neutrons. It also has 13 electrons. The first shell right here has two electrons in orbit. The second shell has eight. It can only hold eight. That gives you 10. The third shell is holding three. That gives you all 13. Now, these electrons in this very first shell are using a lot of kinetic energy to, they're using a lot of kinetic energy to avoid being sucked into the nucleus. The second shell is using less kinetic energy. That means it has more potential energy to do stuff. And this third shell out here, which we call the valence shell, has even more potential energy. It has to use less energy to get sucked into the nucleus than the other two combined. So the further you, further away you are from the nucleus, the less energy you have to spend to avoid being sucked into the center of the atom. So you have potential energy to do something. You can go combine with another atom and share electrons. And that's what happens. Chemical reactions take place at the valence level, at the valence shell. As those outer shell, that, that outermost shell uh, has the greatest potential energy and the least amount of kinetic energy being used. A um, couple of rules here. You know, we're not big on rules uh, and laws and stuff like that in this in AP1. We have the octet rule, the rule of eight. Atoms, the, all atoms want their electron shells filled. They want their valence shell filled. They want it to have either eight or 18 in their valence shell. You know, if it's a second shell, they want eight. If it's a third shell, they want eight. We're not concerned about the other remaining shells. We're only concerned about the first two or three, because that's all we're going to deal with uh, in healthcare. You know, we don't. We're not particularly concerned about you know an atom uh, with an atomic number of a, of 114 or something like that. We're only concerned with you know the 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 ones that are just uh, local, you know, that are you know, localized in our bodies. You know, hydrogen, oxygen, carbon, nitrogen, uh, calcium, sodium, potassium. Those are the ones that we're concerned with. We don't care about fermium or ruthenium or uh, rutherfordium or whatever, you know, some of those, you know, uh, much more exotic, uh, the more exotic uh, atoms. That's okay. We don't need to. You know, we're focusing on the atoms of the atoms of the elements that apply in healthcare. Okay. So we have we have carbon. Carbon has two electrons in its first shell. It has four electrons in its second shell. Carbon has an atomic number of six. It's six protons, meaning it has six electrons. It puts two, two electrons in its first shell, four in its second shell, and you have an atom that's not stable. I mean, carbon would say it's stable, but it's not stable because atoms are the most stable when they have their valence shell filled up. The valence shell is always their outer shell. In the case of carbon, its second shell with its four electrons is the valence shell. It wants to be stable. It wants to have four more electrons in there. And it'll do anything it can to get those four more electrons so it can be completely stable. 
you know, if an atom could think, it would say every day, I want my valence shell filled. Well, you know, that's what causes chemical reactions to occur. Atoms want their valence shell filled. Carbon is actually pretty reactive. It wants to react with other compounds, other, other atoms to share electrons. So it can be happy. It can, you know, it could be. But carbon wants to be happy by having eight electrons in its shell. And the atom that it's reacting with and combining with to form a chemical bond will also have their valence shell filled up too, and they'll be happy. So everybody will be happy. Carbon's not, and whatever will be happy. If carbon is combining with hydrogen, if it combines with four hydrogens, it will be happy. I'll get into that in, in a minute here. The problem is that most atoms don't have a full valence shell. In fact, there are only a handful of atoms that do have a complete valence shell. And you know, that um, those are the ones where they are they're considered non-reactive. Here we see helium. Two electrons, two, pro two protons, two electrons. Valence shell is its only shell, and it's filled up. But it's stable. It's happy. Neon has atomic number of 10. Two electrons in its first shell, eight in its second shell. It is completely filled. It is stable, and it's happy. If it could be happy. So, and they don't react. They are chemically inert. Yeah. But fortunately for us, most of our atoms are not, but don't have their valence shells completely filled. Lithium, for example, has two in its first shell and only one in its second shell. Carbon has two in its first shell and only four in its second shell. Oxygen has two in its first shell and six in its second shell not filled up. So fortunately for us, that's the, the nature. Take a look at this. This is um, how, how incomplete most of the atoms. This is where 90% of 99% of the atoms are located. Hydrogen. Valence shell is not complete. It only has one electron in its valence shell. It would like to have two. Carbon has four electrons in its valence shell. It would like to have four more. Oxygen has six electrons, we would like to have two more. And sodium has one electron in its valence shell, and it would like to have seven more. It's not, the valence shell is not complete. And so these are, these atoms, hydrogen, carbon, oxygen, and nitrogen are all very reactive because they want to get electrons into their shell to make themselves to, to make themselves stable, to become non-reactive, to become complete. And that is what that's what drives chemical reactions. We want to find a way to get to get these electrons. Okay, I'm going to stop here because it's almost 11. And let's see. Okay, that uh, that's we'll pick up on this on Tuesday next week. I remember Monday is Labor Day. It's a holiday. The college is closed. There are no classes on Monday. So, and uh, in lab this afternoon, we're going to talk about uh, uh, mitosis and cell division, as well as uh, movement of fluids uh, across a membrane. So I'm going to get us out of here. I got to get ready for my next class and I will see you all next week. I hope you have a great holiday weekend. Um, try not to think too much about this class for at least a day. So, okay, I'll see you all.